Dan Vanderland. Thanks Nicky Coyle, for how are we? Coming on. I'm very well. We're going to be de- debunking strength training uh, in this. No, actually, no, <laughs> we're not really. We're going to be giving a more fair uh, overview of strength training. So premise for this video was I called you a couple of weeks ago to discuss this exact topic. We got about an hour and a half in and I said, we need to stop this and record this as a video because I think this is information that would be good to have out there to bring some balance. Premise yep. of this being that I think generally in the cycling training space online that strength training is overrated uh i've seen that a few ways let me cover them whether that's sort of like a dylan johnson video or the sort of sports science infographics you see which we're going to be working off today to the constant threads on reddit if you go on the r slash velo subreddit every second day there's a strength training thread people talking about it so you didn't really seem to pick up on that um yeah i i don't spend as much time on the internet as you so i haven't seen all of this hype about it i don't see a lot of hype about it in real life and i actually i'm a bit of a fan of strength training i've been doing it a long time myself um the benefits may not be perfectly for cycling performance though but there's a lot of other benefits just even quickly on my the, the athlete questionnaire we use at neuro coaching when people come in ask do you do strength training do you have access to strength training equipment and are you interested in a strength program? And almost everyone says they are. So even just from that alone, there's definitely a bit yeah. of interest in it. So let me um, actually, Dan, while I bring this up, could you just share your, who, who are you? Uh, could you share your qualifications in this field? Cause you have so much knowledge, a lot more than I do on this topic. What's your, uh, your, your academic background? Yeah, so I'm actually a physiotherapist. I uh, graduated in 2013 uh, with my bachelor's of physio. Um, I've been a coach since about 2015, 2016, um, coaching for Nero. Um, and then now I'm doing a master's of strength and conditioning. So I've done a fair bit of looking at uh, this exact research as part of my master's of strength and conditioning. Um, and yeah, I'm a big fan of strength training. Cool. All right. So my... Look, not to, this is what we're going to work off for this video. And now nothing personally against uh, Martin here. This is, um, he, he does some good sort of infographics on things like this, but to keep this video condensed, we needed to have sort of a summary of, I guess, the hype around strength training. And just this infographic that he's put together was probably a, a good example of that strength training and cycling endurance performance. So he's, he's compiled the results of a few studies that looked into uh, this sort of thing. So I've got all out time trial performance and then power at a submaximal workload. So measured by a, a steady lactate uh, level in the blood uh, and then sort of put the results here. And his summary was that strength training seems to improve endurance performance in trained to elite cyclists. I just think there's a lot more to it. Um, so yeah. what we're going to, yeah, let, let, let's, let's sort of look at this as sort of best case scenario. If you were sort of looked at this, you'd you'd think you'd be mad not to be doing strength training. But I think in reality, uh, it's probably not that simple. Um, I think the first thing to cover with this actual infographic is is it how it uses these arrows and the blocks. And like, it sort of looks like everything improves it. And he's saying strength training helps. And I think it's just a bit confusing that the arrows are the strength group and the, the blocks are the cycling only group. And then probably the next thing to talk about, um, we're not going to go into the Levin study, but only Levin and Slander, those two studies are the only two studies that aren't part of the same group. Um, all the rest of the part, studies are part of this uh, Ronestad et al group. And as part of the issue with strength training and cycling is it's pretty much all the research comes from the one group of researchers from the one laboratory. Um, and as far as research goes, when you're looking at research, you want a number of laboratories backing up the results from one laboratory. It's If it all is coming out of one lab, then it might not be uh, perfect data. And often it, it can actually even be the same participants um, doing the studies again and again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. Interesting. Um, yeah. So yeah, a lot of these are, are Ronda Statadel. The other thing you said when we were on the call was that you weren't a fan of this power at at a set amount of lactate as a way of measuring performance. What was your reasoning behind that? Uh, Cause four millimolar lactate is going to be very different for, for everybody. So that's, you know, your onset of blood lactate accumulation or people say it's your lactate threshold. But when you actually look at the research, the average comes out at about four millimole, but 
your lactate threshold for different people can be, some people might be not much over two millimoles. Some people it could be six, seven, eight millimoles of lactate. So it's sort of this number that's just been picked out and used um, rather than being an actual number that's good for everyone. The other issue with lactate stuff is there's a lot of stuff that can affect it. It's a bit like heart rate where, you know, in the heat that can increase your lactate levels. Uh, you know, what you eat beforehand might be able to, might increase your lactate levels. So it's not a sort of foolproof measure. And as far as, you know, cycling, we, we can so easily measure the power that someone's putting out, the work that someone's doing. Why do we need to have a look at these uh, other physiological me measures such as lactate when, when we have performance, we can actually measure the performance and how much performance is improving. Right. Okay. Yeah. I see, I see what you mean. Especially as well, that would be emphasized because these studies are, have relatively small number of participants. If you had a huge group of thousands of people, you'd probably, the, the error that, that is from measuring this lactate, you'd probably start to reduce that a bit but because if some of these studies might only have 10 people, if someone has a massive yeah. carbohydrate breakfast and throws their lactate off from their, from their baseline test, then yeah, you're going to see that impacting the results a lot more. Um, so, yeah, yeah. And you can see it on, uh, I've looked at a few of these studies. You can see it on a few of these studies that one outlier can throw out the results of the whole study, um, which that's an issue with small, small uh, sample sizes, small, small groups of participants. Sure. Sure. All right. So let's get into the, into the meat of some of this then let's, again taking this as sort of best case scenario let's actually go and pick a few holes in some of these studies because if you just looked at this on face value again you'd probably be thinking this is like a miracle thing to strength training like you'd be dumb not to be including it but let's let's go into some of these so the first one here uh, might be flicking back and forth oh yeah the the Solander one this was you know this, this study is... here this is like hilarious because the title of the study actually says adding strength to endurance training does not enhance aerobic capacity in cyclists. Yet he's trying to sell it as something that does enhance aerobic uh, capacity in cyclists. So, you know, for me, I think that's uh, pretty interesting on its own. Right. Oh, we didn't mention this in the intro, but we, we are specifically only talking about improving what's per kilo Perform aerobic performance on the bike and sprint as well to some degree not obviously dan you're like a massive proponent of strength training just for the health benefits bone density yep. and things like that and but, injury risk is the other big thing right um, yep but, but i think yeah yeah we're, we're talking performance today let's, yep. let's yep. keep it to getting performance. getting fast riding up hills quick so um any, was so, there anything that we want to point I out think in this one? We can go through. One of the interesting thing in this one, if we just scroll down, um, you'll see a little table showing that showing the benefits a little bit lower. Um, and you can actually see between the two groups, just this little table here. Um, so the VO2 in the endurance group, you've gone up three mils per kilo in the endurance plus strength, one mil per kilo, so not as much. Time to exhaustion at VO2 max. Improved actually a little bit more in the uh, strength group, which I think we'll find is a pretty consistent finding across across the board. Um, that that I don't think will be too uncommon, but the difference between the groups it's not huge. And with the small sample size in this, you'd want probably something a little bit bigger difference there. Um, LT four, which I think is the four millimole lactate, you're actually looking at the endurance group improving more, and your forty minute TT, your endurance group improves more. So looking at this or yeah looking at this strength training did nothing for endurance performance in these people i would say right so what what's what's he got here okay so that yeah that that is what he's put so then i why i don't understand why i guess he's included maybe to be fair um to put that in actually no no sorry he's, he's used this here. all out time trial as as a bigger improvement so that's I think he's pulling the data from that uh, time to exhaustion at VO2 max. Um, so we can talk about time right. to exhaustion tests, how they're, they're a terrible test to start off with um, because you want a fixed endpoint. When you're testing a human, if you don't have a fixed endpoint and there's no fixed endpoint, it increases the variability in performance a lot. There's actually a few studies that look at that increased variability in a, in a time to exhaustion test. So for me, a 21 second improvement in the endurance group versus a 36, 
second improvement in the endurance plus strength group with a standard deviation of 21 seconds i would say that is not enough to to really sell that uh your now was your time to improve to exhaustion if i'm seeing this right that these are that's statistically significant because it's got the two stars yeah 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 so statistical significance all that that means is that it is significant we we think there's a low percentage chance that it that it happened by chance um so a p less than 0.01 i believe is a one percent chance that it happened by chance the other time to exhaustion uh of the endurance group to me that 21 seconds that is a is a significant improvement um if you ask anyone that would probably be you know five percent improvement that's probably quite significant the reason why that doesn't hit statistical significance is because that 21 is is probably not enough more than the standard deviation of 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. So I reckon you've probably got a it to to have a p of less than 0 0.05. That's a five percent chance that it is um, that that change is due to chance. Um, mm -hmm. And you're probably looking. It's probably a p value. Of, 0 0.07 or 0 0.08 so it's probably very close to statistical significance but it just hasn't reached that mark and this is one of the issues with science is that everything is all about this statistical significance when you're looking at, at exercise and performance statistical significance it's a factor but it's not everything and this 21 second improvement is is a big improvement and you've got to compare that 21 seconds to the 36 second improvement in the um, endurance plus strength group which mm -hmm. it is an improvement, but it's, you know, so you, you're not looking at a massive improvement yeah. there. And yeah, so you're looking at a, a less improvement in the 40 minute TT. Right. And now let's, let's, let's look at a couple of things. First thing, how many people were in this study? That's what I want to look at first. Uh, Something in your methods, you'll see it there. Okay. Nine 19. people. Okay. Um, in this and field, is that a lot? Uh, in this field, that's a pretty standard study size. Okay, because you could look at, let, let, let's give this the benefit of the doubt and say, you looked at that and said, well, your time to exhaustion at VO2 max was, you improved more when you added the strength training in. So, right, yep. right you could, you know, that's positive. One of the things that's going to come up regularly in this, in, in my chat and that, well, I have the question of is, okay, but did they add the strength training on top of the endurance training? Because that's, the reality for most of us is we've got eight hours a week to train. And a lot of these studies, they just take the eight hours a week and then add two strength training sessions on top of that. And that's not, firstly, that's not realistic for a lot of people because we have limited time. And also then it's like, what else could you be doing with that two hours a week of strength training or 90 minutes of strength training total a week? You should be doing more endurance training. So we need to, that's kind of what we need to look at. Now let's see if we can bring that up here. Okay. So they did their Subjects regular continue. training. They exchanged two sessions with their laboratory sessions. And in the laboratory sessions, they did this 60 minutes of continuous cycling um, at 90% of the 40 minute TT. So 60 minutes at sub threshold, really. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, endurance plus strength group went straight to do a strength session straight afterwards and the endurance okay. group did an extra 2.5 to four minutes okay so right so <laughs> so the strength group's done way harder training because they've gone and done their session and done a strength work and then the other the other the the endurance only group all they've done is cycled for a couple extra minutes to burn a few calories and they don't say what intensity that cycling is at. Right. Um, they've just done a hard training session. So they're probably not going to be doing that four minutes at VO2 max, which may give a benefit. Or do a few sprints. That's what, so or anyway, that's sprints. what I'm sort of getting yeah. at here is you look at this and you go, this is, in, you can't, so you look at that and say, well, there was an improvement, but in, in, in relation to taking away any of this to our own training, this to me, is kind of useless it doesn't say anything because this is not how anyone would apply their strength training or would toss up the benefits of well the other side of that is that you've got a less improvement in your four millimole lactate power and a very slightly smaller improvement in your 40 minute tt so it's it's a trade-off right oh you're saying so eight time to was eight watt improvement eight watt improvement 10, 10 watt improvement eight watt oh improvement. sorry 10 
Yeah. Okay. And then an eight watt improvement at uh, LT4 versus a three right. watt improvement. But the only statistically significant st one was this. Anyway, yeah, those ones were statistically one. significant in favor of the endurance group. That's what that star after them is. That's statistically significant in favor of the endurance group. Right. And not statistically significant in favor of the endurance plus strength group. So it's actually saying that endurance, you're better off doing endurance <laughs> and then four minutes of extra riding. Okay. All right. So <laughs> there Vertu we have Max, it. <laughs> you, you're better off uh, doing, you might be better off adding that strength training in. Okay. I, I think what we can agree on this one then is this is a particularly crap study. It's not a crap. You're you're so harsh on studies. These studies are hard to do. It's, this I, is not I, a bad study. I I know they're hard to do, but there's no way you'd look at this. So, like we we can be super harsh on this study, but like there are better ones that we can pro that will put That's, up more. It's of a, a fine. Point, this I is a, this is a fine study. It's a fine study, and it shows strength training. Like the big things this one shows is that that strength training. Look at that peak power output that's improved. That's a huge improvement. That's like. 50 watts there on your peak power output. Yeah, but it's not that good because this endurance group didn't do any sprint training. Like to make this actually 100%, useful, but you'd need to do strength training. So it's not that yeah. useful. Strength training still did something. So this, yeah, this is what you're going to gonna see. This, yeah, this but, is what uh, you're going to see in the strength training stuff. Anyway, uh, let, let's, this one's, I'm calling it, this one's dead and buried. That's what like, there's no, unless it translate, unless it's kind of test, this is kind of another thing. In my opinion, unless the study has a design which is making trade-offs and using interventions that we would actually prescribe as coaches, then they're not that useful because a coach would never say, well, well, it's like blindingly obvious that adding weights is going to improve your peak power output more than just doing endurance training. Like everyone knows that. Yeah, so, I, I don't disagree. So let's let's leave this tab. So we'll... We'll leave that one. Let's go into some of the other ones. Now, the, this one was the next one we had. This is the, the Ronestad 2017. Yeah. Um, uh, again, oh, this was the one that didn't, I mean, he's kind of put them as equal here. So maybe that's, is there anything you wanted to point out in this one? But the, he the actually power at four millimoles changed significantly. So that's what you talk about here. That the oh, 40 okay, right. time trial didn't really change that much, but the power at four millimole did. So the four millimole is, is not that useful in this case. Okay. Right. And then this one actually shows individual responses. So you can actually see if you, you're on the study, I'm not on you. Scroll down. And if we look at individual responses, a little bit further. Yep, that one there. Yep. So in that 40 minute TT, in that endurance group, you've got one guy there that has gotten way worse. He's gone from like 4.5 watts per kilo in his 40 minute to about four watts per kilo in his 40 minutes so he's half right. a watt per kilo so you're That's talking about how, whole... how these lines are almost like they've been crisscrossed which is not what you want if yeah. you're trying to show an improvement if you want to show improvement most people should be improving but this what i'm talking about here is that that one person there has decreased massively in the you mean like group. everyone else that one and this one uh in the endurance group in the other one so if you look at the endurance group, oh, there's I one see. guy there that's yep. got heaps worse. He's the right. big standout. And he has affected, he would have affected the average for the overall endurance group. So they don't show much of an improvement. Right. You look at the four millimole, again, you've got one guy that's, you've actually got two guys that have gotten worse, but one guy that's got massively worse there. Mm -hmm. um, I reckon this guy just didn't train. He did like a 10 week program. <laughs> he was meant to train. He just did do his training. So yeah. Um, he's gotten heaps worse All right. and then in your in your endurance plus strength group in your four millimoles everyone's pretty much not changed much in that four millimoles so on the left one the other one mm -hmm. everyone's pretty much the same there except one guy's gotten heaps better so he's an yeah. outlier yeah that guy yeah he's an outlier right and he's made the whole group average go up and so they're saying that you know Four millimoles well, gets worse in the endurance group because one guy got massively worse and it gets better in the endurance plus strength group because one guy got massively better. But if you look it, at everyone, and this one pretty much the same. There's another guy, or maybe it's the same guy, but he's also, there's another yeah. massive decline on the I think, endurance. I think that's the same guy for, for both yeah. the yeah, endurance, endurance right. ones. Okay. So, so takeaway from this one is, again, is there anything... 
I'm not seeing many scores runs on the board for strength training right now. So yeah, the takeaway from this one is that um, honestly, in this study, endurance plus strength didn't seem to have much of an impact on the endurance performance for the majority of participants. There's one participant that it worked really well for. Is that because of the strength training, or is that just because he did something else in his training that was really good? Mm-hmm. Um, I I don't see this study as being particularly great for endurance plus strength in improving endurance performance. Okay. This is the same. The Vic Moan one is the same sort of stuff. So if you look at the individual responses to the to the forty minute all out time trial, you got some that improve, some that don't. In the endurance group, generally most improve except one person didn't. Um, and then again, power at three millimolar lactate. I think this one actually probably looks better for the endurance plus strength group. So you've got most, you got a f- about 50% of the people improving significantly. But then in the endurance group, again, you've got one outlier that gets worse. And that, that person's getting significantly worse and just pulling down the average for the whole group. Um, this interesting thing here that they have in this study is that they looked at VO2 at 150 watts. So that is your efficiency. That is how efficient you are at, at riding at 150 watts. And they are showing a general decrease in the um, endurance plus strength group, but it's only very little. Um, it looks like it's about 38 and a half to about 37 and a half or yeah, 37 right. maybe. So, so they do look at something a little bit different there. Um, that's actually looking at economy. Most, most studies that look at economy don't look at VO2 at a certain work rate, which is really what you, your economy is. Um, and this does show a little improvement in your economy. But you can also see in the endurance only group, very variable responses. Some people went down, some people got more efficient, some people got less efficient. Um, and then in the endurance plus strength, generally most people got more efficient. So going down there is, is beneficial. So you're getting more efficient if you go down because you're using less oxygen for a given work rate. Okay, what's a better study design? Well, let's take, let's replace a portion and let's, so yeah, let's let's look into this. I think this one's probably a better, a more realistic example of um, what we're actually going to do. Uh, so they replaced a lot of the training in this one. They replaced about 37, yeah, 37% of the training with explosive right. type strength training. So that's, that's a significant amount. And I actually think this one kind of does look pretty good for the strength training group. They didn't improve. If you look at it, there. If you just scroll down a little yep. bit lower to the results, there's a little table there that has um, your your watt max. So easy experimental group sees the control group. So we look at the easy experimental group. Your VO2. So that's max, the group that did that replace some of their that's strength. That's the group that replaced thirty seven percent. So a very big portion of their. So how much there. can we? Is there a way to see? So how many strength training sessions were they doing? Let, let's okay. Sorry, nine hours total, and then yeah, nine eight point eight and eight point nine, um, for each group. Yep, and then the experimental group thirty seven percent of their total training was replaced with strength training. So it's, Right. I wish, did they say what, like how many sessions a week? Strength training consisted of high repetition, low weight, explosive type strength training. 30 reps. They were doing yeah. 30 repetitions. That's not yeah. what. Not great strength training. Right. No. But they still had improvements, which is interesting. But yeah, I don't think it says number of times a week that they did it. I think it was twice a week that they did it. Okay. So they were doing the same volume of, they were doing the same amount of total training but 37% of the endurance group was strength training. So that's about um, three hours a week. That's a lot of strength training. Uh, so results, let's go down here. E is the experimental group. Yeah. C so, is the control group. so first thing to look at with these results is that your VO2 max for the experimental group is at the start is 315 watts. And then for the control group, or your endurance group is 350. So they're not really like groups at baseline. And as you would know, when when you're training, if someone's at 350, it's, it's going to be harder for them to move up than someone that's at, at 315. But in saying that, you do see a good improvement there in the uh, experimental group. It goes from 314 up to 335. And 
but you also see a significant improvement in the control group from 350 to 366. So that, that star there means it's, it's reached statistical significance. The time trial, again, you've got significant improvements in both groups, 257 to 285, so 28 watts there, and then 290 to 312, 22 watts in the control group, despite um, starting at a higher level. I actually think that's pretty impressive to improve 22 watts over, I think this was a eight week, a nine week protocol. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think this one shows that you can probably possibly get similar results, even if you replace the training. I wouldn't say that the strength training is significantly better, but possibly similar results replacing mm -hmm. your endurance training with some strength training. Interesting, interesting. If you look at this graph as well, though, Which if you one? go down the bar graph, the uh, up, 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 of how much training they were doing. Yeah, that there. D1, D2, D3 is heart rate zones. And you look at the control group and they're doing almost nothing in your D2 and D3, which is uh, 85 to 100% of heart rate at th ventr uh, threshold ventilation. It's a weird way of looking at training, but anyway, it's a lot of base training. So right. the results might have been different if they were doing harder stuff. Right. So they're doing what was the black? What was D1 again? Where was that? Uh, D1 was 75 to 85% of heart rate at threshold ventilation. Right. So they don't, that's like 90%. Wow. Yeah. It's a huge amount. Uh, okay. So yeah, what so, we're comparing here is, is is groups doing base training mm -hmm. and you've still got a similar effect in the control group to the experimental group. But that that might be quite uh, useful information to people that are, you know, in the UK or US and can't ride as much outside because of the bad weather, that replacing a portion of their base training with strength training may be useful in, you know, you can still keep, keep your gains up as far as uh, your, your VO2 max and your... Um, and your 40 minute TT power. But we always come back to Coyle's question. Could they have then done better training, uh, more threshold work, more VO2 work and had even more of an improvement mm. control group? Potential benefit here. Now, one of the things that I have a little point was is just asking, especially as a coach and, and me personally, going and it's quite easy to say, oh, just go and do strength training. But that requires, for most people, it requires a gym membership. It requires traveling to the gym, traveling after. It's it's a lot of effort and a lot of time. And me personally, I don't really enjoy strength training that much. So it's not quite as easy as snapping my fingers and adding it in. So one of the things, points I had when I was discussing this with you was, what if you did sprint training, specific intense on-bike sprint training instead of the strength training? Could that get similar benefits could that bridge the gap is that totally equivalent um yeah any any thoughts on that i think we've got a study here uh yeah, yeah study you've got a study that. comparing uh short sprint training to heavy strength training um but the other thing is there's a lot of actual studies looking at short sprints or longer sprints they call it sprint interval training um, on endurance benefits and you actually consistently see endurance benefits from including sprints in your training so a takeaway for some people might be that if you're out doing an endurance ride add in a few sprints because uh, that might in improve your endurance performance um, the theory behind this is that uh, to recover the sprints themselves might not challenge you aerobically but to recover from the sprints you actually start to get some a lot of stuff going in that aerobic system so it's actually the theory is the recovery from the sprints is what's improving you aerobically not the sprints themselves so i mean is that as is that as good as doing strength training is it equivalent is it the same is it targeting the similar pathways or is it a different thing it's a slightly different pathway so strength training you're going to get that increase in muscle mass, you're probably still going to get a fiber type conversion with the sprint training. But I think that sprint training, as we talked about earlier, those, those enzyme pathways that you might get 
um, adaptations for with strength training, I think they're where you're really going to see your benefits in your sprint training. So it's probably going to be fiber type and enzymes rather than actual muscle mass itself, which heavy strength training will give you an increase in muscle mass. Right. Yeah. Okay. So it's a bit, a bit different. So what? Let, let's look into this study then. I just because this, this is probably what I would as a coach what I recommend. I, I'm not a fan of strength training for reasons we've kind of gone into, but I also don't recommend just doing only endurance training and not doing anything. I, in my opinion, if you're not doing strength training, you need to be doing specific sprint training. So um, this study here, I don't know if you looked at this. So this study, this was a study design. This is what you brought up with me. That was weird because they, all of the groups did strength training. So they did their familiarization. Then all of both yeah. the groups did four weeks of strength training, which is, I don't quite understand why. Why would they do that? Any ideas? Uh, I think they wanted to like, cause that's a pretty normal way that coaches do it. You do a strength period and then you might do a strength uh, sprint period afterwards to try and improve right. someone's sprint. Mm, okay so that kind of annoying for us because we're not we're, we're going one or the other then they one of the groups did heavy strength uh strength training Continued and endurance heavy strength training yeah yeah and then the other group did um their sprint training and their endurance training then they retested them this is a pretty good study in that they've got 32 people that's actually a fair bit for these sort of studies mm -hmm. um so it's yeah pretty impressive um, so and the results i think are probably similar to what you'd expect. So VO2 max, I don't think there's a big significant difference between those groups. One has reached statistical significance, the other one hasn't, but both have improved a very small amount, a couple of percent. Um, the watts at VO2 max, interesting. Um, so explain improved. this, right? So in this sprint training group, 3.2% improvement in power at VO2 max compared to not much for the strength training group, but the strength training group had a bigger improvement in actual VO2 max in oxygen consumption compared to the sprint training group. So, I mean, it, it's the power at VO2 max that it's important for a cyclist, not for performance. Yeah, it is. Um, so the question is, were the sprint training group slightly more efficient than the, the strength training group? Um, by the look of this, you would say, yeah, that was slightly more efficient. Um, I don't think, you know, this is a couple of percent. So people are going to vary a couple of percent here and there um, as far as a lot of these things go. So I don't think there's big differences between the groups there. Um, but it is interesting that they are slightly more efficient in the uh, in the sprint training group than the, the heavy strength group. So if we go up just to, uh, so the conclusion, if we just take the author's word for it, um, in terms of comparing sprint training to heavy strength training, they said uh, sprint training led to a greater increase in average and peak power output on the sprint test compared to heavy strength training, which is interesting. Um, Unsurprising specificity surprising. of training. The more specific the training, if you're actually sprinting on the bike, you're probably going to get more benefits to your sprint than what you are from doing something that's a little bit further away from uh, the strength training. And then again, the specificity, the heavy strength group led to an increase in maximal strength. It's more specific to what they were doing. Right. And then in terms of endurance capacity, there was no difference found between the groups. So yeah. from this study, you're kind of going, well, again, well, the strength training didn't improve endurance capacity. So just in terms of improving performance on the bike, none of this had any impact at all. So that again, <laughs> you're getting such varied results based on what study you're looking at. Um, yeah. And, and again, we've got to come back to the, the thing that you need to consider with this one is that they both did that four week strength training at yeah. the start of it. So that is a confounding factor, but with that little four week strength training block, it looks like sprint training is better than continuing heavy strength training for someone's cycling performance because it improves the short term power more and it doesn't, you know, you, you've got the same benefits so, in your yeah. endurance capacities. Comes out a bit of a wash. Okay. Okay. So let's, let's try and get out of the weeds and try and summarize what we're, what, <laughs> cause that's, it's very conflicting. I feel like people, if we've gotten this far, have kind of just gone, we're not really sure what to do. So 
this is a review, right? Yeah, it's a review yeah, of I, the research. I don't think you're going to get any better with this review. So this is, I wanted to talk about this one because this is often used in a lot of the uh, things that I've seen online about strength training and this review saying how good strength training is for, for cyclists at improving their endurance performance. Um, and what I wanted to specifically run through with this is what this abstract says compared to what you're reading throughout the study. Um, and what, yeah, if we just run through this abstract well, quickly. Are we, are, we just going, are we just going down another rabbit hole or are we summarizing here? This is, it summarizes all the different things for you. Okay. So as long as this we're is getting... Gonna, this is going to summarize strength training. I think. All right. Okay. Let's. So yeah. So I'm ready. If we look at the if we look at the abstract, we're looking at the hype. What we're saying is that heavy strength training is recommended for improving cycling economy. Um, it says that it has equivocal findings on um, lactate threshold, but then it also says that it can increase running power output at VO2 uh, can increase power output at VO2 max and time to exhaustion. So really. What it's saying is that psych, like heavy strength training improves cycling performance. Again, you've got to remember this is a review article, so it's reviewing the papers that are out there. So they all have the issues that we've talked about earlier. So those studies that show that that have, you know, most people improving, but one outlier not improving or that they're not replacing um, mm -hmm. the cycling training with strength training, they're adding the strength training onto it. Right. But this review article, yep. And then it goes through all the different aspects of uh, cycling training or potential improvements. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we just scroll through. If we look at exercise economy, if we go down to the bit that it says on cycling, which is a little bit lower there. So one of the interesting things with this is running economy, it does seem to improve. Mm -hmm. But with cycling economy, yeah, that'll be over here. here yeah yeah so what it's saying is when cycling economy is measured using the traditional way of measuring um economy which is short three to five minute bouts there appears to be little change in combining heavy strength or explosive strength training with endurance training so that goes sort of against what they said in the abstract where they said you should do strength training to um improve your economy because it doesn't when you're actually looking at economy. They do say, they go on to say that it, it can in some studies, but they're looking at different ways of looking right. at economy. So, so they've even said the reason for this, so they've then said, well, oh, but it can improve it over eight weeks in another study, but the discrepancy remains unclear. Uh, yeah. The lower performance of the cyclist in the latter study may have affected the outcome of the strength training, right? So the study that showed improvement was in less trained riders less trained people, but also a lot of the time they're not looking at that actual way of looking at economy, which is the, the amount of VO2, like the energy usage for each sub-maximal work bout. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so they then say, so then they've gone into this one, which was the, the five minute periods over a, a three hour ride. <clears throat> Showed improvement. Again, that study wasn't replacing, that was adding strength training in on yeah. top. So this is the study here. But they didn't replace the strength training. No, they didn't. But you've had a massive 10% improvement in a five-minute all-out time trial at the end of 180 minutes of uh, endurance cycling. So this is, for me, I think this is the best example of why you would use strength training because it's a bit like a road race. So it's a long sub-maximal time. So you're spending a long time out there. And then a full hard out effort at the end of that, you know, mm -hmm. last hill climb or the push towards a sprint. And there's a big significant improvement in the endurance plus strength group. I think having more muscle mass, um, having stronger muscles can help to delay fatigue a little bit. I think the summary of strength training is that it's probably, it's inconsistent whether it improves your VO2 max. It's inconsistent whether it improves, say, a 20-minute, 40-minute time trial. It's inconsistent whether it improves someone's lactate threshold. But this, I think this is shown in not just this study, but another study as well. It consistently showed that a five-minute all-out effort at the end of a long period of submaximal cycling was improved with strength training. 
Um, okay, let's go hyper. That's that's a bit uh, that's a bit like a, a road <laughs> race. Okay, but let's go hypotheticals here, right? So if we if we say okay, then in terms of if we call that fatigue resistance, yeah. and we say the strength training can is assisting the fatigue resistance, <clears throat> and this is the improvement here. So you can see that the different there between the endurance and strength training, and then almost a decline in the endurance group. Where would a where if you had to guess, where do you think a sprint training group would fit into this? Do you reckon it would be the same as this, or it would get some part of the way if you had to guess? Because that's again, if we start, to, this is why I get frustrated looking at this. Is because well, there wasn't a group that did proper sprint training to compare to, and that's what we would be realistically in the real world would be doing. We wouldn't be doing nothing. Only endurance training would be. We would be doing sprint training. So. You know. Yeah. So at a guess, I would say that they get some of the way. I think as we've talked about earlier, that those changes to the, the muscle enzymes might improve that five minute all out at the end of 180 minutes. But I think there might be a component here of just having more muscle mass to be able to cycle between the muscles. And that you when you strength train, you also get type one muscle muscle hypertrophy as well as type two. So that type one muscle hypertrophy might mean that they're stronger than which are the slow twitch muscles that, right which are the slow twitch yeah. muscle fibers yeah mm -hmm. um which means that they're they're stronger at that at that sub maximal so they might be burning through at that sub maximal work rate so they might be burning through their their type 2 muscle fibers a little bit less and save them a little bit more for the um the five minute all out effort at the end there so mm -hmm. i th i think i think the enzymes might might give you a little bit of a boost in that endurance group, but I don't think you'd see as much as what you see in that endurance plus strength group. I think 10% is a massive one. If I was to guess, I'd say maybe three to 5% with sprint training. Okay. If that's the case, as far as I'm, from what I can see, professional cyclists, most professional cyclists don't do good strength training year round. Do you agree? I wonder how good strength training they do even in the off season um if we're talking about <laughs> but let's just let's training. not say good let's just say but some yeah. form of strength training right i do, i think rarely rarely professional cyclists do strength training in season um and i think logistically it is too hard for them and okay. this is one big issue with strength training is a it has a big fatigue cost um I know you've done it, Jesse. I've done it, you know, especially when you first start doing your strength training, you've got sore legs. And if you've got sore legs and you try and go and do a race, you're probably not going to perform as well. Um, and then during season with these cyclists, you know, if you're doing a three-week grand tour, you don't want to finish your three-week grand tour and then, you know, have to go home at the end of that and start doing some strength training. I think that's, you know, you just want to rest and recover. So I think it's really hard for the, the professionals to fit in their strength training they're definitely not fitting it in during the grand tours um mm. so it's about fitting it in around it um and they race a lot so which so i don't think they are with, so i don't think a lot are i think most of them don't i don't think they are fitting it in around I, I think it's too hard to fit it in around all their racing i think they race a lot right um if you look at it, a lot of them are doing you know 80 to 100 race days in a year mm -hmm. that's a race almost every three or four days mm -hmm. um if you're doing a race every three or four days, you know, where does the strength training fit in? Mm. Um, but I think that's a little bit different from what amateurs can do that amateurs are racing a little bit less. So maybe amateurs can fit in a little bit more strength training. And okay. this comes to my bias of, I think strength training is pretty good for your general health for, you know, bone strength. Ah, we don't care about reducing that. We risk know, of injury, we know, get off, all that. That stuff, get off your so. high horse. We know yeah. your bones and stuff. All right. Let's this, um, yeah, coming back to the review. So yeah, the that's review. the exercise Anything economy part. Yeah, I just wanted to go like they go through each of the, the different things. So for the lactate threshold, if you go again to the cycling stuff, power at lactate threshold, they say it's equivocal. Some studies show some sort of little benefit. Other studies don't really show any difference in cyclist lactate threshold. So it doesn't really support improving someone's threshold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then uh, the other big uh, one yeah that's all a lot of that's all threshold stuff the other big one is endurance performance so again in the in the abstracts they talked about it improves endurance performance 
but right here in that first first few few lines here it's saying that you know the traditional way of measuring cycling performance is time trials lasting 30 to 60 minutes however the effects of strength training are contradictory so some show improvements some show no real effect um and so this is the problem with with if you pick out one study because if you pick out one study it might show a big improvement but if you look at the weight of the evidence what all the studies are showing they don't they don't really show that cycling is really improving endurance performance a lot in these you know all out 30 to 60 minute efforts the, the strength training yeah is the strength training yeah yeah i think they go on to okay. say i don't i don't know exactly where it is but they go on to say yeah right there last line there nevertheless there are no reported negative impacts of concurrent training on endurance performance and I think their abstract should have emphasized that, that strength training has the potential to possibly improve things. It's inconclusive evidence, but there doesn't, across all the studies, there's no real studies showing any negative impact of adding strength training in. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really valuable for, for your amateur cyclists out there that, that might care about general health. I know you don't, Jesse, but the ones that might is that it's not gonna hurt your, your cycling performance. And it may have the potential to improve things, but you're probably not going to see any big changes in your VO2 max, in your lactate threshold, um, or your cycling economy. Right. So the other thing, yeah, that's that's fair. I, I think the other thing I wanted to hit on, right, because this is the way I see a lot of people doing their strength training is they'll do it through the off season, through it, they, so they're looking to improve performance, and they've heard that strength training can help. So they do it through for, let's say, two or three months throughout winter in the US, snowed in, so they're doing it. What I would say is we know that when you stop strength training, as with most things, the benefits go away. So if they're doing their strength training for, for two months through winter, by the time they get in season, do you think there's going to be any lingering benefits from that? Or have they That's wasted their time? That's a tough question. It's a, it depends thing. And I think it depends on what they're doing. If you're adding in your sprint training on the bike, especially if you're doing some big gear sprint work, I think there's a potential for that to, to hold on to your strength, strength gains for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, what we see in a lot of these strength training, detraining studies is that it takes very little to hold on to strength gains. It takes a fair bit to build them, but it takes very little to hold on to the strength gains. So I think you'll find that maybe especially some big gear work might, might hold on to that strength training. And I think it was every 10 days was how often that a cyclist needed to do strength training to maintain all of their strength gains in season. So mm -hmm. as long as they're doing a little bit throughout the season, they, they might actually be able to hold on to a lot of the benefits. And this is again, something that we talked about on our phone call earlier is I think a lot of the benefits that they might be holding or that might last is that increases in muscle mass and stuff that they've had in the off season that will taper off through the season that might be helping to reduce their risk of injury. Um, and yeah, their, their bone health that they pick up in that three months in the off season, mm -hmm. if they crash, that might help that they, they don't break a bone or something like that. You, you don't need as big doses with those as what you would for improving pure performance. Um, and as far as the injury risk with, with the strength training in the off season goes, I think what's really important there is a lot of cyclists with their off season coming into their, their pre-season stuff is they up their training a lot in cycling. And if they haven't done that strength training, then they might find that they get injured with that big increase in their training. Whereas if they've done that strength training, then their body's just going to be a little bit more resilient to, to being able to increase their training loads. See, yeah, maybe, maybe. Still don't see it. I'm still not convinced. So looking at like that, that's why when I look at this, right, I'm like, unless you really enjoy doing strength training and you love it, I don't see a reason to force yourself to go to the gym included. If you're just looking at getting better on the bike, that's kind of my, I guess that's my take on it. Um, to summarize, I just don't see in the evidence enough evidence that it's worth forcing yourself to go to the gym to do your strength training to replace some of your some of your work on the bike some of your sprint work on the bike to go to the gym i i don't i don't see it 
I mean, definitely don't see a reason not to do it if you enjoy doing it, but it's not something I would be, it's not, well, I don't do it, but I also, it's not something I'd be prescribed like forcing someone to get a gym membership to go and do. Um, I just don't think the benefit's going to be there um, for performance on the bike. Do you think that's, uh, am I too negative? Am I too naive? Or what do you reckon? No, I think it really depends on the person here. So if you're talking about someone that's working, you know, five days a week, they're struggling to even get in eight to 10 hours a week on the bike. If you're talking about maybe removing some training on the bike to put in some strength work, I think you're probably even going to be harming that person. They're going to get worse performance by adding in the strength work. If you're talking about someone that has all the time in the world, has plenty of time to recover, plenty of time to work on their training and stuff. I think in those people, there is probably a benefit to strength training. It might not be pure endurance performance gains. I don't think we can claim that it's pure endurance performance gains, but I think it's in terms of like risk. FTP improvement, in terms of FTP or VO2 max improvement. Okay. I think there's definitely a sprint improvement. There's only a certain amount of work that sprint training on the bike can do. There's a reason why every track sprint cyclist is in the gym that that just, you just need to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so there's definitely a benefit to that sprint training. And then there is also those benefits to body resilience, to um, increasing bone density, lowering injury risk. Um, I think there is benefits there. And again, I'm going to come back to that study, which improved five minute power output at the end of 180 minutes of cycling. There is, there is a potential for some race like benefit to your, to your strength training there. Um, whether it's as cut and dry as uh, if you did some better cycling training, whether you'd get Ast it. But yeah. So then there's the asterisk there of if you've, yeah, yeah, well, if you've done it off and then if you've maintained it through, throughout the season too, because it's, you know, people doing strength training in their off season, the time where you're going to want that benefit in that, in that fatigue resistance is going to be in season, which could be like three or four months later. So yeah. if you're doing it for that benefit, you're going to meet, you should be topping up your strength training. You, as you said, uh, once every, well, about once a week, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. To act, to hold on to that benefit. Otherwise the, that might not be there. Yeah. Right. And this is like, you know, what I, my, you know, like you said, we have in our questionnaire, do people want a strength training program or not? I, my first question is why do you want a strength training program? If it's for general health, I recommend it. it it's, yeah. it's good for general health. If it is to improve cycling performance and they are limited on their amount of time that they can train, especially if it's to improve endurance performance and not sprint performance, I don't often recommend it. I, mm -hmm. I often say you, your time's probably going to be better spent on the bike as well as all those other things like the extra cost of a gym membership, the extra logistics of getting to the gym as, instead of just jumping on your bike. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Love it. All right. Uh, well, I think that pretty much covers it. Thanks for taking the time to come on, Dan. Appreciate it. Enjoy editing that. <laughs> I'll cut it up. <laughs> um, cool. I might just end it. I'll hold yeah. on. I'll stop recording. <laughs>